Hello, everyone. My name is Asal Shokati, Ayurvedic practitioner and healing artist. And uh, I'm here with you today introducing Joyce Ulrich, a wonderful friend, I would say. I met in Houston through yoga, but there's so much more about it. This is part of a series of interviews or chats I've been doing with practitioners that I've worked with or know, known for a short period of time or a long period of time, and one way or another, I'm familiar with their work. So there's a wealth of knowledge that's coming to you through these videos. And today, Joyce is here, and I'm going to do a little introduction before she gets on the screen to speak to you. Joyce has been teaching Pilates for over 20 years. Uh, she was first introduced to it in 1985 while dancing with the Houston Ballet. That's very impressive. And took advantage of the amazing techniques to rehab from injury, returning to the stage strong, balanced, and prepared. Her interest in fascia was first ignited in 2004 at a workshop with uh, Yamuna, uh, Yamuna Zeke, sorry, creator of Yamuna Body Rolling and Tom Myers, author of Anatomy Trains. Joyce continued digging deeper into the concepts of fascia and spatial medicine, as well as continuing her Pilates studies with the Pilates Center of Boulder and many first generation teachers via the Pilates Method Alliance. In addition to Pilates, Joe, as Joyce goes by, is a Yamuna Body Rolling practitioner I couldn't roll my <laughs> tongue, as well as a coach and instructor of Rossiter for pain relief. She's the owner of Pilates Treehouse, which is located in the Houston Heights area. Joe's the only faculty member of the Center for Spatial Medicine in the state of Texas. She's proud to have mentored many talented Pilates teachers through the Center for Spatial Medicine uh, Bridge Program and Teacher Training introduced uh, Yamuna Body Rolling to the Houston Ballet as well as Houston Proper and brought the Rossiter stretch techniques for pain relief to the Houston area. What an impressive background. Hey, Joyce, <laughs> welcome. Hi there. That was a mouthful. Goodness, you did really well with all of those <laughs> crazy names. Wonderful. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. This, this amazed me because I've known you for a while. As I said, we met through yoga and the type of yoga I did was uh, a play on the Iyengar method with elements of spatial medicine, which has personally helped me uh, heal uh, a really difficult injury. So oh, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This uh, something that happened to my knee and uh, which was supposed to take more than four months after the second month I was able to with the help of special medicine uh, and Salise, the lady that we met through, uh, get that, get that fixed and that knee has been getting stronger and stronger. Eventually That's really better wonderful. than before. <laughs> So I was very impressed to know more about because I knew you through uh, special medicine and the workshops and the classes that we did together and your work with Pilates, but working with Yamuna and Rossiter and the topic of injury we're talking about, I was just ah, I'm like... I asked to talk to talk to you and just didn't know what amazing stuff are going to come up. Even um, getting ready for the meeting, my jaw was dropping, <laughs> and I wanted to get. And I was getting more and more excited. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked a little bit about injury, and prior to this chat, you asked me to define injury. That was a very thought-provoking question. So I said something like, well, uh, pain is part of it. It's not all of it. it. It can be damage to tissue and it can be long lasting. It can be the story or chronicity of uh, the injury morphing into something else. And why don't you tell us what you told me afterwards of your definition of that? Sure. Um... 
Yeah, I asked you what you, de you defined injury as mainly because I wanted to know if you felt like it was specifically about pain. Uh, and pain is really, we're learning that pain is really something that is an interpretation through the brain about a sensation. Um, and some people are set up to have a louder volume to that sensation and then define it as pain. Um, now an injury, yes, if someone has broken their leg, sprained their ankle, definitely please go to probably a Western medicine. You know, we don't want to work outside of scope of practice, but when we discuss this, it is information and it is telling us that we need to pay attention, but it could also occur through almost thought, a holding pattern, a stress, a tension, a chronic stress as opposed to an acute stress. Um, and when we find a way to respond to the sensation versus potentially react to the sensation, sometimes we don't have to own that as pain or injury. So I don't think we always have to define pain as injury. They're not necessarily one and the same. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And you tapped into a very important point that it doesn't always have to be that causing, is, you know, when you talked about thoughts, I, in my work, uh, not necessarily solely Ayurveda, but in general work that I do, I pay a lot of attention to stuck emotion in the body. And what are those, you know, thoughts and emotions, they come probably from the same realm. Absolutely. And, and there's a concept in Ayurveda um, that says ama, ama is blockage. It's blockage that can have external sources, internal sources, and that can be physical or it can be emotional and mental. But once it's stuck there and natural uh, flow of body gets obstructed, uh, this this pain comes to be about. So tell me more about your experience with it, working with clients or in your own uh, personal life or professional life, um, examples of that kind of pain. I would love to. I want to go back though, if we can, yeah. to your thought about injury and, and your, the emotional that you speak of in your work. So I love speaking to other modalities, other practitioners, because I learn so much and I see how similar we are, how we all have the same goal, but we might have a slightly different tool to achieve it. And one tool may be more appropriate than the other, but when they work together, they are amazing. But one of the other things that you wanted me to talk about speaks exactly to when you spoke about that emotional block. And that's fascia. And I think this may surprise you that I bring that up now because we think of fascia as a very physical thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's hold that thought. It is a physical thing. It is what creates the shape of us. Oh, wow. Yes. It is um, the architecture that shows that I have shoulders of this width and um, a body of this length or girth. It, if we took the bones away from our body, the fascia would hold our structure. If we kept the bones but got rid of the fascia, the bones would drop to the ground. Same thing with the musculature. It's like pudding if the fascia is not there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so it, it is not what holds us together. Muscle is told by fascia to move us, but fascia is our structure. And what a soft shape. structure it is. It is, and our bones are held in the tensional structure of fascia. I'm gonna get one of my toys because I forgot another one. This is our body. This are the bone, these are the bones. Okay, this is a tensegrity model. The bones hold the tissue apart. 
However, at the same time, the tissue holds the bones both together and apart. Wow. The bones swim in the tension of our bodies. Wow. Okay, so trying to put all the pieces of the story together, my body also listens to me. My structure listens to me. It almost is a rough nervous system. So when I am unhappy, think about the person depressed down the street that might be talking to you just fine, but has created a demand in their body without even knowing they're asking it to do it. Think about that other person that's super happy. They've changed their structure. They've asked for that. Hmm. They've, they've asked their tissue to open or close or hold or let go. Wow. And when we repeat those patterns, the tissue of fascia gets more and more dense with layers and layers and layers like you're adding strapping tape to your structure. The wonderful thing though is that as you can ask your body to keep doing this thing over and over again, whether it's subconscious with stress and strain and worry, or it's the violin bow that you're taking across your body that continually straps on more and more to your structure, you can also ask it to let go. So this, this is a very, very interesting thing you're telling me. Um, I, I do this a lot. I keep going back to Ayurveda a lot. <laughs> it's it's ancient wisdom, and um, in you know the consciousness model, which I really focus on, talks about body uh, being of five layers, uh, holding the soul or housing the soul, or vice versa. But you know, it's not just the physical body. We get immediately to the energetic body, then we get to the lower mental, which is the emotional and mental. And then we go more to causal, intuitive, you know, some say karmic and beyond more bliss body until we are at the level of our God, godness, basically. Um, what you're telling me about fascia, it reminds me of like, not quite the energetic body, but in a physical way, doing exactly what the energetic body is doing is almost like a very very thin veil between you know the two or the the line where the body crosses into that do, do you see it that way based on my explanation or tell us more about fascia uh, there is like a scientific definition but there is also there's so much more based on what you're telling me right so fascia is a connective tissue uh, and it does just that, it connects us from one end to the other. It is one of three, in Western medicine, I guess would be the best description. It is one of three whole body systems. You have your circulatory system, your nervous system, and your spatial or fascial system. Fascia itself, the word, the category, is constantly being redefined. And within those experts that define it, they don't necessarily fully agree. Mm. Some think that bone is part of fascia. Some think that only the periosteum coating the bone is fascia. And so it's almost minutia. Um, I think because for me, I need to always be able to relate to an idea I would describe fascia very much, if you're familiar with it, with a uh, loofah sponge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got to plant and grow loofah sponges from a gift from someone probably 10 years ago now. And I got to watch them grow. And I think they're just such a great I don't know if the word is analogy or metaphor for our body and especially the visibility of the fascial structure 
um, inside it. As it grows, it gets bigger. You feed it, you water it, you give it sun. It's green, it's heavy, it's hanging on a vine, much like a squash or a cucumber. And then it starts to get brown and it gets browner and browner and browner from the bottom to the top. So from where the flower was up to the stem. And as it does, it gets lighter. So you've seen now what we would in a body consider the death of the body. It's gotten lighter, the fluid has gone away. And then you can start to open it. And you can take the layer of skin away. And on the inside of the skin, it's probably the layer of uh, fascia that is subcutaneous. And it's much like the, the pith of a citrus. And then as you open it, you start to see the cellular structure. Interesting. And you can imagine that the muscle is ensconced in that, but it has already, the fluid of the muscle has already gone away in that loofah. But then you can shake out all the seeds from the core. Uh -huh. Now that's a really, really, uh, in, the, in the fitness world, that is a loaded word, isn't it, core? Yeah, absolutely. Because everyone's like, oh, I want to strengthen my core. And I'm like, well, let's, de let's decide what that is. What is that? And they said, well, it's my abdomen. And I'm like, okay. What if you're more like a plant than you ever knew? What if you're an apple or a loofah, right? And you have the flower. So maybe your feet all the way through the body until you get to the stem, which is probably your tongue. Yeah. If we dissect it through anatomy tra trains maps, mm -hmm. it would be your tongue. So here you have this core that runs from head to foot in very similar to a biotensegrity model. If you expand out into it, you are strengthening your core with no holding of contraction that stops. Didn't you talk about stopping the flow? Yeah, constriction, stopping the flow. Yeah. So you are creating space and you're strengthening and it's the opposite of what at least the world believed Conventional. for decades as far as like, you know, the physical body and uh, physical education, <laughs> strengthening it. Wow. So, I'd like you to do something for me. Sure. Scratch your head. Good. Let go. Now. Contract your bicep. Good. Scratch your head. Oh. <gasps> Stupid, huh? Just so silly. Ah. But was it? Which one was easier? Just doing it. Oh no, which one was more efficient? Absolutely the first one. Absolutely. So that idea that we need to prepare in a way that has to do with muscular contraction doesn't really make sense. It's like leaving your foot on the brake while you put your other foot on the gas at oh, the same wow. time or leaving the, the emergency brake on you're gonna burn out your brakes. You're gonna burn out your energy. So there are so many concepts and modalities and movement that are, that are heading this way mm -hmm. because every single one of us wants to be an efficient animal so that we can rest when it's time to rest, so that we can find strength when we need to find strength. Your body, your fascia will know the difference between picking up a feather and lifting a big box. They, it, it, we are so intelligent that we do not need to get in our own way. Oh, amen. Wow. Right? Yes. I mean, it's so exciting. It's so fabulous and brilliant. And it's simply learning how to respond to stimulus instead of react to stimulus. 
-hmm. It's not saying you have to be correct and overthink things, which I think we've kind of done to ourselves. Just as a society, those of us that have been really, you know, we've been really diligent about being good. And in a way, if we're not careful, we've overthought it and we've gotten in our way. Mm -hmm. Hence the tree house, we need to play. We need to be curious. We need to find a way to truly be honest in some safe environment of, well, that probably wasn't right in my movement, meaning it's not my most efficient, meaning I may need to find something that is not as comfortable or as easy at first to find something other meaning something that is not already my habit that I've had for me for over 50 years right yeah so we have to acknowledge and honor where we've been Mm -hmm. and then we have to say but I still have the ability to shift and change and if we think about how we do it and honor that it might be and I kind of joke when I say this to my students or clients it's like now when you grow up I want you to know that this is our goal (laughs) that means I don't want them to get there now because they're going to put another piece of different strapping tape on what their body already has Mm. so what I want them to recognize is that we're going to get a little bit better today and that's good enough for my ego (laughs) I need it to be good enough for yours so that we actually can get to when you grow up. Mm, Interesting. It, it reminds me of, um, you are a practitioner of yoga. No, I'm not a practitioner. I'm a student. Definitely a student of yoga. (laughs) You're a student of yoga. I must Um, honor my teachers. Oh, absolutely. Don't we all? (laughs) But yes. there are teachers within us, us as well yes. that we respond yes. to. And uh, one thing that, that's come up, and it's like through different discussions, because I've been, um, I've been, say, practicing yoga for years, and I still, I, I don't consider myself a yogi or anything. I'm just, this is part of life for me going through different schools and different teachers and again finally uh come to uh experience uh hiring air with regards to spatial medicine which was just groundbreaking um i had brought upon uh so much pain and discomfort now through different methods whereas um Say, for instance, uh, doing Iyengar yoga, it's more of a rigid um, practice of yoga, physical yoga. And what we tend to forget is every society, every mentality, every geography, every, every culture, every place we've been requires, even every person is so different from the next person, but let's just look at the society what possibly works at some point somewhere it's not necessarily what's working right now in a more mentally driven constricted uh i'm just talking about the united states where you and i live society so maybe maybe somebody who has too much looseness (laughs) doesn't need anymore and a little bit of uh, maybe a little bit of structure, rigidity at, at a healthy point is the right way for them to go. But the same for somebody like me, already rigid and constricted at that point, doing that, what I noticed is I began getting stronger in different areas of my body. At the same time, from my knee to my right ankle, my right leg became like a bow huh. in a course of one year. Wow. I, I, I did that. That is fascia. <laughs> I, had yes, to undo. Very nice. I had to undo. I had to unlearn. So when I started practicing yoga with spatial medicine, everything had become counterintuitive at that point. But 
I had forgotten what the natural state of my body was. I had forced it into a mold that necessarily wasn't my mold. Yeah. So what's wonderful about spatial medicine is it does not matter what technique, what modality you use. And I will say that um, yoga is a great one to bring it into the wider audience. And I would say that I'm a fairly, well, fairly, I'm a very flexible person. However, defining flexibility really needs to be changed. So everyone that I know in my past experience, that sort of conventional history of movement, it's always been range of motion. Oh my goodness, especially as a dancer, she can get her leg up to her ear, up to her nose. She can hold it behind her head. They consider that flexibility. I would suggest that in many ways, that isn't the same thing as a, an increase in space to create flexibility. So flexibility or stretching should be the idea of having a greater communication from one end of the body to the other. For example, if I can take my, and you're not going to be able to see this unless I stretch back, here I go. I, if I take my arm out to the side, fully to the side, it looks fine from where you are. Yeah, it looks fine. However, if you could see me from the side, I have displaced my rib cage to get there, mm -hmm. which means I really haven't created length or range that is honest and true, I've actually robbed Peter to pay Paul, <laughs> right? And in the Pilates world, that would end up with a potential cue of draw your ribs down. Pull your shoulders back. And this is not just Pilates, this is obviously most modalities, right? We're looking at what it is on the outside. However, there is an entire world inside that we don't even see while we try to open it. We don't want kinks in our structure. We want space, yeah? So oftentimes we give, and I will put a we on it because I am a teacher and, and all of us have a reason to give certain verbiage, but then there are times when we own that ver verbiage as if it is the rule, the fact. Mm -hmm. And as students, especially diligent ones, we hold on to that as if it is for always, not just for now. Mm -hmm. And there might have been someone that one of those ideas or concepts really spoke to them. Um, and they felt a great stretch in their downward facing dog and their hamstring, but they also shoved their rib cage towards their, towards their thighs or the floor to create that ideal of downward facing dog, which to me is the when you grow up stage, right? That might happen, but I think it's something you receive. And here I am, I'm speaking about yoga when I should be speaking about Pilates but they have similar shapes and these are more recognized perhaps. So um, they, if you can keep the expanse of the front to the back of the body, then you're honoring your core. Whether that is in a plank or whether that is in downward facing dog or upward facing dog. If you can always consider that your true goal is to lengthen around the short side instead of make oh. the shape happen, then eventually it will be a full sphere of shape that honestly will just begin to play, right? That's amazing. So for instance, like the, the area that's constricted more that's where we create some space because the rest that can do it better would automatically follow. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
I'm in awe. <laughs> oh, now it's so fun to talk about because it really gives us so much opportunity to create change. And if we realize what a gift that is and, and potentially take the pressure off, then we really give ownership of a body back to that body and back to that person. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a really beautiful tool to be able to listen and sort out and feel the communication that is not just one way in your system. I have a question that just came to me. Is this more of a modern day phenomenon, like the way we live life now? Um, let, let's forget about you know our diet and this and that. Um, that we are so away from uh, where we need to be, or is it just like by the virtue of being a human being throughout the centuries? we just like lost that connection? I think it's a bit of both. I think that it has been evolving for a long time as we do, but I also believe that a lot of the um, conveniences that we have now actually cause us to be less healthy, very uh, unaware, kinesthetically unaware and dissonant in our systems. Right, and even to recognize that the texting hands mm -hmm. and the tech computer mm -hmm. are all things that are playing out just like any repetitive motion might be doing in our body. It doesn't have to be necessarily an action. It could be a physical shape that you hold. We, we've been told by many people that sitting is the new smoking <laughs> because, because we've demanded this shape on our body for long periods of time. We've demanded this shape on our body for long periods of time. Um, we've, or even worse, we've demanded, sorry, this shape of sitting on our body for so long that if we stood up, we couldn't come out of the shape. Oh, wow. So we have not only like tensional stress, but again, the layers and layers of the demands that we've been asking our fascia to, to do to create, that's like we have uh, very, very heavy denim material in on our body that's very very tightly woven and it's only gotten tighter and tighter while we stayed there to open it it's going to take some steam it's going to take an iron it's going to take time it's going to take uh perseverance it's going to take patience it needs to All be hydrated but first we exactly. need to open up the creases for the water to go in there Exactly. And, and our fascia isn't hydrated by how much water we drink. Mm. It's hydrated by movement and movement can be defined by physical, personal movement. It can be defined by massage. It can be defined by uh, a ball work like I do. All of those things hydrate the tissue. They wring it out to allow the fern like aspect of the tissue to rehydrate and suck in like a sponge, like a loofah sponge, a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> that, that fluid, right? It's called bound water as opposed to drinking water. Mm. Yeah. Wow. There's so much to it. And at the same time, it can be so simple. We don't need to completely understand it, but we could be in awe by it. Absolutely. And so um, the modalities that you work, Pilates, Yamuna, and Rossiter, can you tell us a little bit more about how the combination of three comes into play? And uh, some may not even be familiar of, even heard of Yamuna or Rossiter. Tell us a little bit more about those as well. Sure thing. Uh, I will start with um, Rossiter. Uh, it's probably the most dynamic uh, piece of work that I do. It is a two-person stretch technique using the weight of my foot on a person 
It's not massage. I don't do any techniques with my foot. It's literally my body weight as that person is comfortable with that. And I ask them to do specific stretches. Mm -hmm. So the work comes from a gentleman named Richard Rossiter. He is an advanced golfer as well as this technique he's created. And it's a technique that you'll hear in manual therapy called pin and stretch. Dr. Ida Rolf called the, the work pin and stretch where you would place weight with your hands because this is a manual therapy and you would ask for movement because then the tissue opens away from where the pinning is. It's a very similar technique with the foot um, by placing my weight and you're opening up the tissue and with the client or participant so involved and so in charge, when they own the work, it's more profound and longer lasting. So that was actually the last technique that I added to my toolbox. Um, and mainly because I thought it related so well with what I do. Uh, Yamana body rolling is a type of small ball myofascial release work. Probably the, she's probably the matriarch of any kind of small ball work. They're all brilliant. They all have their special things. However, hers is a softer ball, but it goes deep to stimulate bone. And if it's stimulating bone, it's having to pass through all that other wonderful tissue to get to it. Exactly. And taking that time, and again, not just rolling around on the ball, but hanging out there, hanging out there and adding movement again. And as with all three of these particular modalities and people who created them, they all believed that there was a natural organization to the body and that we were born with that natural organization and that we could, as Mr. Pilates says, return to life. That's the name of his book that introduced his mat work. He had an original 34 mat work and um, he created equipment to enhance the floor work because he felt like people could not find that inner structure. His work is mainly done on springs on the equipment. Mm -hmm. So that means that you're learning how to open the springs by opening your body all the way from head to toe so that eventually those springs mm -hmm. are in you instead of on the equipment. Yeah. So that that takes you back to the original work, which was the mat work, and you can do it as if you are spring-loaded. So, so many, especially Mr. Pilates, he knew without knowing that the fascial continuity of the body was all one system. He had to have known it. If you look at the design of the movements as well as the design of the apparatus that he invented, it's, it's just, and the history of the work, it's all there. It's genius. Yeah. It but is it really intuitive, is. but we do- But counterintuitive. <laughs> I know, but for instance, like, you know, you, when you started explaining Rossiter and, you know, the weight of the foot and the, the stretching, and it's just like, it's something sometimes I naturally crave. So I would ask, mm -hmm. for instance, my cousin to do something or, it, and that's why I'm saying it's like the intuitive thing, but we just, uh, when we're too much in our heads, <laughs> we cannot even think of that, but the body so, craves it. So you respond to that craving. And someone that you spoke to recently spoke a little bit about that ability for those, those that are sensitive to find what intuition they hear on the inside because it is what they act upon. And that's what speaks to me. Yeah. It's, it's all connected. And as you said, doesn't matter which portal we're going, going to or through. Once we reach a certain threshold, it's all there. We see that. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's, all the, it's all one. I won't say it's all the same because they all have their beautiful personalities and distinctions one from the other and histories. And at the same time, that goal of whole body health. Yeah. 
and whole body movement, whether that is physical movement or movement on the inside, energetic movement. And uh, Mr. Pilates last third of his um, big concepts is breath, which we know is in all of these as well. Yeah, every, every, everywhere we look eventually uh, for a holistic way of being, we will get back to that breath. Even, right. you know, in the poetry of Rumi. <laughs> it's it's pretty amazing it's a journey journey of following the breath but most of the times we don't know it until we find another portal and then and then we reach there we take the rest of the way so when you train people um how do you train people I, i know you work with clients and things did change as of 2020 but um i know as the the sole person um, in the, let's call it Academy of Spatial Medicine, <laughs> Center for Spatial Medicine. Uh, what do you have coming up and uh, what type of clients do you work with who are practitioners or not? You know, of course, everybody can take advantage of such amazing methodology that, that's out there. But also, like, tell, tell me about the practitioners, different types of practitioners that you work with. Sure. So I I work with a huge variety of people. Um, I had the honor during this time, which is so strange. But what a wonderful opportunity to work with some of the professional dancers that I used to work with that have since moved away because they were unable to perform. So we spent time together and were able to work on themselves. So um, that was wonderful to sort of catch up with. It's like old school week, uh, my students. Um, We have during this time also worked with um, the Contrology Pilates method, which is part of the Center for Spatial Medicine. It is specifically the group who have already gone through another Pilates comprehensive training and are professionally teaching However, they want to put this lens on what they do and what they teach. So we've actually just completed a group that started right before the shutdown in March of 2020. And we had two more sessions with them while they continued their work in between. And so they are um, planning to test out at the end of September so that will be wonderful. That means we will have more uh, bodies practitioners with this paradigm in the United States, mainly in Houston, another one in California, um, and a few in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, I have taught a few Rossiter um, level one and level two. So in Rossiter, he always believed, as did Yamana, does Yamana actually, that everyone should know his technique. So that everyone, in, one person in each household should know these techniques wow. so that they can take care of their loved ones. Sounds like CPR. <laughs> right, but, but before CPR is ever needed, right? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, no, it's okay. So, so he, so I have had clients and their spouses take these courses to take care of each other. Um, I have had uh, mothers and daughters take these courses in the past. Uh, we've obviously, both by circumstance and choice, had smaller classes this past year for safety, but uh, we are still teaching level one and level two of Rossiter. Um, and we have one coming up end of September and level two coming up beginning of October. They're two day, two day classes. They're really for anyone that wants to learn how to uh, walk away from pain, really. Um, wonderful. And, and anybody can, from anywhere can participate, but they're based in Houston, absolutely. correct? And in, in person? I teach these two courses. They are in person. 
there are courses all over the world, actually, in this work. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at uh, the website is uh, www.rossiter.com. Um, and the, the schedule for trainings is there, but you can also find practitioners there. I believe we have close to 20 practitioners in the Houston area now, 10 of whom are up to the level four air four level, which is an advanced level. Impressive. A lot of whom, a lot of whom are graduates of the bridge program as well. So the CFSM bridge program, because we all see how well these things complement one another. So, um, and then we have scheduled at this point, and it has been rescheduled twice, I believe, a uh, connecting with fascia workshop, two day workshop, I want to say it's November 6th and 7th. It is that weekend. I don't know if that's the correct Saturday, Sunday dates, um, but it is that first weekend in November um, and hopefully we will be able to have that. I have it in my, light, my sight line that we will be doing it. Um, it is really all about making the movement through connecting with fascia. And you alluded to the idea that there is more, that like your layers, your five layers. Mm -hmm. And I would say yes. That some of us don't necessarily speak to meditation mm -hmm. or somatics. However, if your movement and communication through your physical body creating space, it will bring you to better live in your core, meaning the inside and innerness yeah. of you. That, that real center. <laughs> it really will. You don't, it, and, and all you need to do is play and listen and wait and observe. I like that play and the Pilates treehouse. <laughs> well, you also have a gift for putting uh, concepts into a very poetic way of being. And, you know, that's the rhythm of life. It's, it's very, very beautiful to oh, thank you. imagine. No, thank you. We didn't do any, any exercises or practices, but uh, with your words and also with your demonstrations, you, you did a fantastic job of making at least me as an audience understand what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I hope so. And sometimes these concepts are better right now for concepts. And if, if we ever want to take it further, one, there's connecting with Sasha. And two, I'm available if anybody's curious, right? So, so tell us how again, I love it. <laughs> Tell us how you can be found. Tell us about your website uh, and the social media. Sure. Uh, my website is www.pilatestreehouse.com. Um, I am most easily um, connected with by email, uh, Joyce at pilatestreehouse.com. I am visible on Facebook. Um, the page is Pilates Treehouse and I'm visible on Instagram Pilates Treehouse and I actually have a YouTube channel Joe J-O dot Pilates Treehouse um, they're all me playing but um, you can again the best way to get in touch with me is the contact information you'll find on the website um, and I'm happy to, to, to hear from anyone that wants to. That would be wonderful. I will share all that um, in the, you know, on the video and also down below. So people would have access to your information. And from there, they can get to know more about the methods you talked about, even like, you know, international centers that are out there for uh, special medicine and Yamuna and Rossiter. What a oh, wealth yeah. of knowledge, what a great resource. I just 
I'm so glad we connected again this way. I am too. What a <laughs> wonderful way. I see you on the boulevard. We wave and it turns into this. Yes. That's the way of the world, isn't it? <laughs> that I think it was a supermarket, right? <laughs> oh, yes, that's true. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and getting to work together in the yoga class. Absolutely. And, and Karen uh, Locker's uh, two-day workshop right before the yeah. shutdowns, as you said. Um, that's right. And her website, where I'm faculty, where you'll see more things of this nature, is www.centerforspatialmedicine.com. However, it is spelled in the very English way. So spatial with a T and center with R-E at the end. So that will be there as well. Because there's still webinars, et cetera, that are going on. Yes. In addition to this in-person workshop that we're hoping for in November here in Houston. I see, I see there are things happening in Europe and European times, but, uh, but it, hopefully... I, and I know there are viewers of these videos from all over the world, so they need to know. Like it's, it's, at some point, she was also in Dubai, so I know people are in Dubai watching. She this. still she does live in Dubai. Oh, she does live in Dubai, but there are practitioners all over. We have some of her uh, work is being um, shared in Japan. Um, some of it is being shared down in Brazil and another part is being sh shared in Zurich and all of these are places where uh, some of the students reside so it really is entering the universe yeah <laughs> worldwide network um, again thank you exactly. very very much for being here this uh, these videos these chats they're dedicated to practitioners, students, enthusiasts, and people who are simply looking to another way of living life, being, and bringing wholeness to their, to their probably, I would say, the most important wealth that can someone have in their life, which is health, you know, by mind, body, soul, spirit. And uh, please, everyone, do subscribe to this channel or share the video with somebody you never know if someone will find that answer they've been looking for for a long time and find joyce somebody with such wealth and such beautiful way of um, conceptualizing and bringing it uh, into action out there so thank you so much for your time and thanks everyone thank you. for watching